All right, folks, in this video, we're going to be talking more about fire hardened bows. So stick around if you want to see what happened to this one. All right, guys, so I'm up here in the trophy room with Keith Shannon and Thad Beckham. And we're looking at some different bows here. And in my hand, I've got something that I wouldn't have, before I saw this, I wouldn't have thought was possible. This is a bow that's made out of sweet gum. What's the, what is this, 66 inches? Oh, uh, about 65, I think. 65 66, inches. Somewhere in there. Fire hardened uh, sweet gum bow. Sweet gum, if you're in the southeastern United States, this stuff is a weed. It grows absolutely <laughs> everywhere. Um, and what's the what's the speed on this bow with a 10 grain per pound? Well, it's arrow. 50 pounds with a 500 grain arrow. It, it, they averaged about 176. Yeah. yeah. Over 170 feet per second. So what we're doing today is we are we're looking at some of the different bows that uh, that these guys have made. We're talking about fire hardening. We're talking about how fire hardening is opening up. Uh, opportunities for folks that might not have access to things like Pacific U and Osage, which have for decades have been thought of as top tier bow woods. These guys are making bows that will shoot just as good, if not outperform some of the bows that, some of the best bows that are made out of uh, Pacific U and Osage with species that just about anybody can get from a local wood lot if you live anywhere in the eastern United States. So stick around, we've got some pretty cool stuff to show you. What other whitewood species have you had success with? And, and have elm. you ever find, so elm, elm. we got elm, hickory, Dog wood. sweet wood, sweet gum, uh, uh, white oak, dogwood. dogwood. This is a uh, piece of persimmon. This one fairly well, and I re you see I I, I kind of retilled it a little bit after fire hardening. That is surprisingly um, light for persimmons. A, a persimmons a dense wood, yeah. Yeah, wow! I got a beautiful piece of persimmon at home. This is a piece of dogwood. Pretty nice. Mm -hmm. uh, All this is just experimental stuff over here for the most part. Uh, here's a piece of L, and you see it was cooked really hard. Nice bow. So as we look through these bows, you ought to notice that they all hold a lot of back set. Keith refers to that as reflex. That is due to the fire hardening these bows. Typically, a white wood bow just won't hold this amount of back set. So I, I've had pretty good luck with elm. Dogwood works good, white oak works good. Um, um, so I'm not an expert at all woods, but I've never found anything that will outdo hickory. So hickory is a very, very, very tough in its tension strength. And so you can, I mean, you can mess up a hickory bow and not break it on the back. It's very unusual for a hickory bow to break on the back of a raw one. And so it's tough in tension, but it tends to be weak in compression. And so what happens when you build a bow and, and pull it, it takes string follower set because those belly cells are, are compressing and it just doesn't have that spring back. What fire hardening is doing is it's hardening those belly cells, making it more resistant to compression. And so you can end up having bows like this that when you unstring it, it springs back to its original shape. It has much more cast. Uh, and what, by, what I mean by cast is it just zips that arrow out there. When you drop the string, uh, you have a much faster, more efficient bow. You see, here's a hickory bow that I browned. I blacked them all the way through. This is one of them that I tillered, shot three different times with no problem. And the fourth time I went out there and just kind of hard pumped and it broke on me. That's um, amazing that you even got that to full draw on the tiller now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. with, with it. I mean, that's just shard. Uh, All the way through. Yeah. But uh, this was a test. I've, I've done this a number of times, just sacrifice, just see how far I could push it. 
And what I was after to learn where the outer edge is. Yeah. Is there a benefit to it? Well, you get you never learn where the where the where the drop off point is unless you go over it a couple times. You know because if you start sharing this information, people, that's the next questions. How far and, can you which go? Which was a question in my mind. How how far can you go? And I know I knew this just looked obscene, and it is. But I was shocked that I was able to tiller and shoot it three different oh, times. Yeah. And then the only reason it broke was because I just strung it and snatched it to full draw in the fourth outing and it broke on me. Yeah, this is, uh, this is rare. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I thought. I just didn't get it. I just this, didn't get it. This is medium rare. This is rare. Keith is looking at this bow that I made in the bow making for beginners video and then tried to fire harden in the will it break video. I brought this bow up here to get his opinion on it. Yeah, yeah, that's probably about right. You see, it's kept about half. That's normal. That's air. That's that's kind of what you expect. It would be really interesting to if you put it back in the form and you brought it back up to fire harden it again. If any of that would stick. I've only done this twice. I want to see it a half a dozen times, and then I'll come out in public with it. Well, let's uh, let's let's throw this one back on there and see what it does. Keith is talking about recooking a finished bow that's already been fire hardened once. Typically, Keith will make a blank, fire harden that blank, and then make the bow. So this is a bit of an experiment. We're also going to fire harden another much shorter paddle bow that I made several years ago in another video. And just one, two, three, feel what it feels like. One, two, three. Stick it in. Put, put it just like that. Put your bottom. One, two, three. Yeah. You see that? That's kind of about where you want to keep this thing. So about a three count to where a three count. you don't want to hold your hand down there. That's about it. One, two, longer. three, and you want to take it out. Okay, so your distance is not, you're not really concerned with the distance. It's mostly just the, the hand. Certain hold. amount of heat. All right, so we've got, we've got these two bows on here. We've got uh, a little paddle bow on the right-hand side here uh, that I built probably two, two, three years ago. Did a video on it. Uh, shot it maybe half a dozen times, basically just made it to make a video. Haven't done anything with it, it's just been sitting around the house. Um, we're, we've got this on one of Keith's back set forms right now. We're going to cook this for the first time, never been, uh, never been over a fire before. And then over here we've got this latest uh, hi uh, hickory bow that I made out of water hickory. I went through the, the, or tried to do the fire hardening process on this bow, and we got something smoking. Where? I see smoke coming. From where? Like right in here. Well, there's moisture coming at you, bro. <clears throat> that could be. Yep. So I see a little bit of smoke yeah, coming. Steam. Yeah, I see it smoke coming or steam or something coming out of this area right here and Keith said that's just moisture coming out probably coming out of this uh this little paddle bow because it's been sitting just out you know out the shit outside it's telling on you that's right <laughs> <laughs> um so this bow that we've got here this is the last uh bow that I made uh made out of water hickory I went through trying to replicate the process that these guys showed in the video that they put out their fire hardened fire hardened whitewood bows video and I didn't get the I wasn't aggressive enough with it I didn't get it uh, close enough to the coals I think just didn't get it hot enough and so the the fire hardened that I got on it is kind of a very mild uh, mild hardening and so we've got it back on here for another trial or another run. We're going to see if we can get that heat to push a little bit farther up into the limbs and see if we can get this thing to stick more closely to the form that we've got it on right now.
for me this is all a learning process that's why I came up here just to learn as much as I can and so you know if it it on the on the bow that I've already tried to heat treat or uh, fire harden you know if we get added performance then great if we don't then well we weren't okay. either way we learned something but I can tell you right now that bow shoots very hard oh yeah I've ever haven't shot it yep uh, it shoots right up there with any of the any of the Osage bows I've ever made I'm gonna look at this all right this thing's coming on hot what time is it to you? it is 333. Oh yeah. Uh, we're done. We don't want to do no more than this. You can kind of see a little bit of the browning going a little bit deeper. And you definitely see it on that side. Oh yeah. You're there. Yeah. Let's straighten them up, put another block on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this around. One side's got a little bit more than the other. You know what I do? I mean, everybody does it different. I usually start up higher and just give it, and a lot That's of time cool. mine will be on there three hours. Now see, here's a good example. That being a finished bow, there's very little margin of error. Yeah. If that was a blank, I'd say, oh, what the heck with it. Until that hit, that black, turned black out there, I'm not concerned. Yeah. Um, so so this, is, this is a, you know, this is a perfect example. It, it's not a, it's not any recipe. It's not a certain height. It's not a certain amount of heat. You just do it till you see what you want, and you see the browning come about halfway into the bow. Whatever it takes to get there, add heat. Take away heat, raise the bow, lower the bow. Whatever you need to do. To, here's what I, I take the form, I look at it and say, okay, I got a little hot spot. There's nothing wrong with shifting your coals. So you're just looking at the, the color on and the I'm wood. I'm just looking at it from here and I'm taking this and saying, okay, I got a little bit brown in here. I'm just gonna shift it back. And so I'm gonna put a little more heat in here than I had in here. Okay, stick it back up there. We're gonna toast that handle area a little bit more. So there's, uh, it looks like there's some smoke coming out of here, but this bow for the last two years has just been sitting out in the barn. And so the moisture yeah. content in there's probably 13% or so. At least. Or more. That's why it didn't brown as quick you know, <clears throat> as, as that. Yep. But and so- I've uh, never seen one brown this fast ever. This, uh, this smoke is actually steam. It's just the moisture coming out of this wood. Let's see what we got here. All right, you see how we got a, we've got a light browning, almost a light browning, almost, almost all the way through. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not the the white. Yeah. You can see your a little bit medium brown and coming in a little bit past the edge and you spotty up and down the bow but we got a light tan coming all the way through the bow i think you could leave it a little longer keep myself well, we could and but we're going to end up browning it all the way through yeah this is a relatively short bow yeah you, you, how yeah. long you plan on drawing this bow oh i'll draw it all the way oh if it blows it how long is it 60 inches oh mm. let's not do it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you push it <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Feel like it was almost stuck. Even. All right, folks, so we are back home and we're going to go ahead and string up both of these bows just to see what we've got. Now, it's been, I think this is the third day after uh, I went up there and spent the day with uh, Keith and Thad and fire hardened these things. So let's go ahead and see what we've got. Now, just for reference, let's go ahead and see how much back set we've got in this. So this is right now, this hickory bow that we made in the last video is sitting right at three and three quarter inches of back set. This little paddle bow here
right at two and a quarter. Tiller looks good. Let's throw it up here. I, now I don't have a scale with me. I wish I had a I wish I had a scale, but I just don't have one here. Oh. Well. All right. So I got this little hickory bow that we just blew up, and. I wouldn't have expected it to do that. I mean, this last hickory bow that I made, I put it on the coals, wiped the damp rag on it, and an hour later, I was drawing that thing to 29 inches. And so for this one to blow up at only, I mean, I probably was only to maybe 20, maybe 20 inches, 18 inches of draw, and it just went kapow. Um, I got to looking at it. Now, now when we were, before we ever put this thing on the coal uh, up there, Thad was looking at it and says, you know, it looks like you got some wormholes in there. And I, I looked at it and there was a bunch of little specks on there where the flies have got in there, got on here and put little fly specks on it. So I said, oh, that's just, that's just fly specks. Well, I look at it now and I can see a wormhole right here. Um, and that's really the only one I see on this limb. And I got to looking at this thing and right here, right where this thing came apart, the fault line, there's a dead blame wormhole. I, I just, I almost missed it, but sure enough, there's a wormhole in there. And so there you go. That's the rest of the story on this one. And that's all it took is one tiny little wormhole that's less than a sixteenth of an inch went down in there. The thing with these worms, they don't just drill straight in there. When they, when they burrow in there, they'll go in there at whatever distance they go. And it depends on the different types of grubs that get into the woods. But it, they'll burrow in there and then they turn and they'll burrow at a, a 90 degree to where, they're, they're, um, where they, they entered the wood. And so it's not just that little pinhole that's in the, in the top of the bow or wherever they burrow in. It's that hole and then another one that goes to the side. And so this bow has been sitting out here in the barn for two years. And that's all it took was one little grub to get in there, make a little hole in it. And I just didn't see it, you know, didn't, uh, didn't notice it before we cooked it. But I still would have done it um, and just seen what happened. But there you go, there you, can, you can see the results. So this failure wasn't a result of the fire hardening, it was just a bug. All right, so moving on to this other hickory bow. This is the one that I made in the last video. Uh, the bow was actually shooting pretty well. Uh, the reason I wanted to put it back on the coals and fire harden it a little bit more was basically just to learn. I wanted to see if I could get any better improvement. I really wanted to see if I could get it to hold any more back set than it was holding um, immediately after unstringing it. And so if you remember from last time, uh, I shot it probably a dozen times or so, unstrung it, and it popped back to about, if I recall correctly, it was about an inch and a half of back set. Um, but then just sitting around for a week or so, it probably went back to two and a quarter inches or so. So after putting it back on the form, uh, putting it back over the coals, right now we're sitting at three and three quarters. Let's go ahead and string it up and hope it doesn't blow up. So we're at 26 inches right here. I just wanna give it a little pull by hand to see what it feels like. Oh, oh. 
thing is way heavier than it was. So I'm going to have to take some wood off of this. Otherwise, I'm going to stress the wood too much. Let's see what it does. All right, so I went ahead and took 10 good scrapes off each limb with my pocket knife. Just trying to keep things even. Seven. out she's probably 60 pounds Let's see what it does when I unstring it oh. all right so the immediate back set after that is about the same inch and a half all right, folks, so this is the next day. I went ahead and just let this bow sit overnight just to see how much of that back set it would gain overnight. And you can see that quite a bit of it's come back. I'm just gonna put it on the wall here and see what we've got. So we've got, oh, right at two and a quarter inches of back set overnight. Now, that doesn't really matter. Uh, how much you gain overnight doesn't really matter. What matters is how much uh, spring back or how much back set you get immediately after unstringing this thing because that's where that's really where all your performance is coming from. That's what's available uh, to preload those limbs with energy and transfer that energy to the arrow. So you know if you unstring it and you get one inch of back set uh, and then overnight you gain another inch, that extra inch doesn't really matter. The only reason I put it up here is just to show you guys uh, because I know some of you are gonna have questions. Now, uh, let's go ahead and string this thing up and go shoot it a few times and, and uh, see what it does. Now, one thing I do wanna mention is I, I did go ahead, I took a few more scrapes after I turned the camera off. I took a few more scrapes off the top limb because there was a slight imbalance in the, uh, in the tiller here. Had a little more gap uh, in the bottom than I did in the top. And you can kinda, if you look back at the video where I was drawing on the wall, you can kinda somewhat see that the top limb's just a wee bit stiff. And so I went ahead and took out a few, evened that tiller up and uh, so that we don't run into problems in the future with you know, the tiller becoming even more unbalanced. Let's go shoot. You can tell this bow has a very high early draw weight and that's, that's due to that back set. It's a little bit heavier than I'm used to shooting. But I can guarantee, I don't have a chronograph back down here, but I can guarantee this thing is shooting well into the 170 feet per second class. It's probably pushing 180. move my point of aim down a little bit shooting about three to four inches higher than I normally would with my other bow You know, so the real test of this isn't coming out here and shooting it a dozen times or a couple dozen times and then unstring it. It's really would be leaving this thing strung like you're hunting all day. 
and I think I'll do that. I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and take my quiver off my Osage bow, throw it on this, take it out for a couple days of hog hunting, and see how much of this back set it retains after that. And when I go hunting, I leave my bow strung all day long. See what she does. So uh, that's probably an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half of back set. I'm, I can sit here watching this thing come back. I mean, it's the the amount of back set it's 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 just gaining it as I'm sitting here watching. All right, folks, so here is what I know. Uh, this is by far the best white wood bow I've ever made. Uh, it'll shoot right up there, just as good as any of the Osage bows that I've ever made. Um, I wish, I don't have a chronograph down here, but I, I feel very strongly that this thing's gonna be shooting in the high 170s with a 10 grain per pound arrow. And so for this bow, it's, yeah, I would imagine it's right around 60 pounds at 29 inches. So I'd be shooting a 600 grain arrow way over 100 feet per, 170 feet per second. And, <clears throat> and for a wooden bow, that's pretty dang quick. So I built this bow in the, in the exact same dimensions that I would make my typical Osage flat bows. It's just a sh little shy of an inch and a half. It's actually an inch and three eighths wide, 64 inches long. Uh, and the reason, typically I would make a white wood bow a little bit wider. The reason I made this one narrow like this is because it was made from a pretty small diameter tree. This tree was only about three inches. And so if you make it really wide, you end up with a big crown on it, which can cause some problems later on. Um, but anyway, I think with the next one, I'm gonna try to find a tree that's a little bit bigger diameter so I can have a little bit flatter back. I'm gonna make it a little bit wider down here at the, uh, the first 12 inches or so of the limb and then taper it right on down. I'm gonna see if I can't uh, make it a little bit wider like that so that we can retain a little bit more of that back set, see if we can't push that performance just a little bit higher. And so to continue to learn about this fire hardening process, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a hickory tree, hopefully I can find one that's, oh, in that eight to 10 inch range. I'm gonna go ahead and cut and split up a bunch of staves and I'm just gonna start making a whole bunch of white wood bows and see if I can't get this dialed in. I'm gonna experiment with a little bit longer uh, bows, a little bit wider and uh, just see what, uh, what I can make them do. Uh, but with that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and stay tuned because there's gonna be more of this stuff coming up. And then also there's some more hog hunting adventure where uh, we're gonna be in Florida until mid-March. Uh, we're actually gonna be going down to uh, do some feral goat hunting in, uh, in some of the Caribbean islands, so that ought to be fun. Um, and then we're headed back to, uh, to Idaho, gonna be doing some bear and turkey hunting up there. So subscribe, stay tuned. We'll see you guys on the next one.